Uh, good afternoon, everyone, or good evening, uh, and this fa in this fading light, and welcome to the Law Tech London uh, Trends and Predictions 2021 uh, discussion panel. Uh, I'm David Chaplin, uh, editor of Computers and Law, the journal or magazine of the Society for Computers and Law, and I'm joined today by three uh, experts in this area who will introduce themselves uh, to the audience. First of all, you, Stacey. Hi, everyone, um, and thanks for having me. My name is Stacey Sinclair. I am a partner at uh, Fennec Elliott, which is a law firm specializing in construction, energy, uh, and infrastructure. And I am the head of technology and innovation there. Okay, thank you, Stacey. Nick, over to you. Hi, uh, my name's Nick Watson, and I well, was formerly a web developer, and now I run a virtual dating company called Ruby Datum. And I also run another company called Legal Legends, and we help people with their user experience in technology and building kind of bespoke legal applications. That's as short as I can make it. <laughs> okay, finally, over to Jonathan. Hello, David. Hello, everyone. Thank you very much for having me. My name is Jonathan Mars. I am a, an independent consultant working in legal IT and uh, discovery. Uh, I've been in legal since 1745, so I've seen all the developments over those periods, those decades of IT in practice in law. Okay, thanks a lot. Um, and of course, welcome to everybody. There's lots of uh, nice greetings coming through on the chat panel, so it's good to see you all here today. Just a quick word about the format. Um, we're just going to—it's going to be an informal chat. But we do welcome some uh, questions to come in from you, the audience. Uh, if you do want to send questions in, I'll try and weave those in to the discussion with uh, our panelists as and when appropriate. We may also run a couple of polls as well to keep you interested. Uh, so uh, keep an eye out for those. We would like to get your feedback and, uh, and your thoughts on some of the issues of the day. So let's get started uh, looking at some of the issues and trends in uh, and what's been happening uh, over the last year. Of course, uh, this time last year, the pandemic was sort of unimaginable. Um, just getting the first glimpses of it, weren't we, I suppose. One year on, has the pandemic changed the priorities for legal tech? And are firms reining in or ramping up spending on technology? Has it had an effect on investment in those areas? Stacey, is that? Um, I have to say, um... Spending as as was it as it was before our priority our priorities are as they were before. I just think it's a lot easier now. I, I've been pretty, um, you know, the opportunities. Obviously, it's unfortunate in the current environment, but have been really helpful for us in legal, not just legal technology, but technology in general. Um, I think, but you know, anything that you know increases our productivity or our efficiencies, our workflows. Um, they, they always were a priority and, and they, they certainly are a priority now, you know, even more so for working from home, getting everybody together, um, you know, you know, our, our clients need it, want it. And, you know, we, we obviously are focusing on them. So, um, yeah, our spending, again, you know, the same. Um, I think it's probably easier now to uh, make uh, business cases and use cases for technology, which I uh, really welcome. But, um, is, that, is that what's made it easier? Has it made it easier to, to, to push technology because of what's happened? Well, I think you see, oh, yeah, you see, um, you know, everyone sees how significant, how, how part of your, your daily life it is now. Um, if you want to work in the office of your day job, you need it. Uh, so it does make, make my life a bit easier on that front. And I'm just still on that. Is, is have uh, the staff, uh, your, your employees, the workers you work with, are they more embracing technology a bit more because of, because they've had to? They've had to. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I think we, but you know, we've got a nice mix. We've got a nice mix. We had it before the, the pandemic started, but you've had to. Um, some have done it, you know, more willing than others. But, you know, within, you know, within three weeks, we were, you know, up and running. Of course, there were teething problems, you know, as, as everyone I'm sure had, you know, you know, you had to survive, you had to get on and, you know, we did the best we could. Um, we, you know, I was pretty proud of us. And, you know, we, we worked through that sort of initial learning phase. And I, I'd like to think that we're in the refining phase and, you know, doing it better. And um, I wouldn't call that innovation. I'd just call that, you know, 
uh, getting on with them. Um, you know, that, that would have taken us, you know, probably, you know, five years. Um, and that's been accelerated within the matter of weeks, which is just absolutely brilliant. Okay, it wasn't, it wasn't pretty at times, but it was, um, you know, it's a good thing in the long run for us. A bit, bit, bit later. Um, Nick, uh, Johnson, have you got any thoughts to add on to that? Uh, yeah, well, yeah, sure. I, the, I mean, I'll let Jonathan go, go first. On. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, the, the very word that was going through my head as Stacey was um, telling us how life was with her was acceleration. Um, this was all going to happen anyway, but it was going to happen in the traditional law firm five decade period rather than a five week period. Um, so I agree with everything that Stacey said. Um, I think for all those reasons, for looking after your clients, for uh, keeping the business going, for being able to earn an honest buck, for uh, keeping your staff and your colleagues healthy and sane and involved. Uh, and I think that what we're now seeing over the past year is that all legal press is how cyber has also accelerated its attacks. And law firms are particularly vulnerable and particularly interesting because of all the confidential information they hold. So I think that's going to now, now that I would imagine that, that Stacey's firm, now they've settled down and are, are uh, sort of twisting the, the dials the last little bit to get everything right, will probably be focusing on things like cyber once the, you know, now the business is operating in this remote manner. I, absolutely. And I think you, you get more attention now with that as well yes. than we perhaps did previously. Um, you know, you're still going to get a little bit of resistance, but I think minds are more open now. The mindset's changed. And, um, you know, I think it's going to be easier to get further uh, than we would have done previously. Definitely. Yeah. Uh, I've got a kind of very, very varied experience uh, to this, having worked with many law firms and uh, owning a legal tech company that sells into law firms also. Um, I found that COVID is essentially, like Jonathan said, it's an accelerator, it's an amplifier. Those firms that were making the transition into more technology have been able to do that easier. Some that may have been open to it before are more open to it. But what I've also seen, um, casting aside the whole working from home, remote working thing, and just focusing on the other aspects of technology, I've seen those more adverse to technology actually kind of cut all their tech budgets. Um, I've seen people kind of burying their head in the sand saying, OK, it's just remote working now. Let's forget all the other technology. Uh, so it's kind of accelerated it for some firms in that direction also. Uh, but for those firms that are truly into the tech side of things and want to grow there, I've seen it uh, amplify that and, uh, you know, make it more possible as a kind of culture shift happens throughout the country and um, company. Sorry, I, I concur with that, actually. Um talking about suppliers to law firms i've seen the same polarization i've seen those organizations who see this rightly as a tremendous opportunity like fennig elliott uh, and those who are just batting down the hatches and avoiding doing anything other than the, the absolutely necessary and waiting for it all to blow over or hoping it will all blow over so i think yes there is that polarization in the market generally um, but thankfully for the leviathan that is partnership it's actually opened their eyes or at least made them as receptive as Stacey has said. So, but I am, I, I do agree with you as well, Nick. I'm, I'm straddling mm. the fence quite nicely here. I can see also, I mean, we've had, I, I, I absolutely agree. Um, I've been really pleasantly surprised um, on, on some, uh, with some, uh, you know, members of our firm and other firms where, you know, historically they would do nothing unless they had been delivered, you know, sort of a hard copy bundle. And, you know, I'm helping them with um, e-bundles. Well, let's just get one started so I can get going. I can do it myself. Or I can, um, you know, um, we've got a little, you know, some, some upscaling going on in, in other areas. And I've been really pleasantly surprised that some people have really taken to it. Um, yeah, others maybe less so, but um, they may not have been minded to anyway previously. So... Yeah. I think that's that. I, I I I can see that as well. Sorry to keep interrupting. I'm a, I know I'm a terrible interrupter. But, um, I've 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 seen and I and I also welcome this. I've seen that the uh, prevalence of, of video meetings like this and 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 everyone sharing problems, that business has become a lot more personal. We're allowing our business people, our colleagues, the people on the other side in in cases, into our homes, literally, like now. Mm -hmm. 
we're all very understanding if a dog barks or a child wanders across throwing um, cake at the window. Uh, I think life as business life has become a lot more personal and therefore we are more inclined to help each other out in order for the, you know, for the greater good. I think there is a polarization in human nature as well. There are those who really want to be at the front of the queue and will jump on and stab and everything just to get in front. And there are the vast majority who only want to help and make things happen. And I think that's being reflected in business dealings and meetings. And I, I welcome that very much. I mean, I I've, I've, I've been do, I've done some work over the last year with uh, Professor Suskind on a remote courts project that uh, yeah. he's been, uh, we've been sort of trying to gather some stuff together. Um, and obviously the accelerator point, I mean, it has accelerated uh, the use of technology in the courts, unbelievably so. Yes. Um, but I take your, I also think your point about um, how it's made it more personal. I mean, it has lost a bit of formality. And I know some judges are slightly worried about the lack of formality in online hearings. But there again, others have been have welcomed it. They've welcomed the fact that they can be, um, there are two aspects. They've welcomed the fact they can be a bit more informal, a bit more human. And they've also welcomed the fact that now people can, can observe court hearings. I, I know this is slightly outside the commercial world we're dealing with. That they can observe court hearings from um, from anywhere um, and are being allowed to do so. And the irony is that once they go back to um, in-person hearings a bit more, that 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 transparency might um, might actually be redu reduced uh, again. It might be a window of opportunity. Uh, at I the moment. so hope not. I so hope not. There is so much that we can learn about doing business in a much more civilized, modern way that has been much needed in all industries, but in particular in law. And I would really hate that the skin that's risen up in re response to the pinch does not elasticate itself and go back to how it was nice and flat. I hope that we have good lessons learned from this horrible pandemic and that we take those forward positively. I, th I think also, if I can just add, I think it's been really beneficial in some aspects for our clients. I think they're benefiting from it. In, if, you, if you have small hearings, if you have applications that can be done remotely, you don't have witnesses traveling around the world, you don't have those sorts of costs. Um, it's, you know, there's a lot of benefit to having a, you know, a sharp, quick, sh all right, the TCC, the Technology and Construction Court, I, I, I take the point. Um, it, it's probably closer to business as usual than perhaps the family courts or the criminal courts. Um, I, I, I completely appreciate there are very different issues that those courts are facing. Um, but there's, you know, we, you know, there are some really fantastic benefits for our clients um, that that would have cost more previously. So I, I, I really welcome that aspect as well, and they're really embracing it. Um, they, they will, the, the, um, you know, j judges will, you know, they will be, uh, you know, quick to tell you. I mean, it is, <laughs> it is a different experience. Uh, you know, there is, there are other constraints and other issues that one takes into account, but, but, you know, you, pros and cons, obviously. Well, one great advantage for me is I've been running webinars for a long time and I've tried to get judges involved to, to you know, speak on a webinar. And I used to have fear and trepidation when I said, hey, push this button. Uh, now I don't. They can, they can <laughs> it's, uh, it's great to hear. Um, I mean, moving on to the, the, this, I mean, we've obviously been touching on working from home. And that's been the other, I mean, the, the enormous change that has happened this year. Um, what do you think the long lasting impact of this has been? I mean, we've touched on it being more personal, perhaps. Um, um, and also, as, as Stacey said, it's all done in a bit of a rush. What still needs to be done? You've touched on a couple of those issues. Cyber is maybe one for this to look at for this year. Um, but what, what other issues? What, what, what are the issues that you're going to have to look at to make sure that working from home works, both now, while we're still in lockdown, and as we move back to, because what I'm, I'm assuming is going to be a hybrid model, um, in, 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 you know, in six months' time, what, how, how will that work? And what, what, what legal technology, what will, it, will the law firms have to do to adapt? Who wants to go first? Who, sorry? Who wants to go first? Nick? Um, I'm going to have to sit with that one a second because uh, my first response to that is I don't know. <laughs> but, um, I, I'm going to reflect on it some more if that's okay. And, uh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, I'm happy yeah, to have a shot and get the ball rolling. Um, the... I think we need now, as, as Stacey said, they, they, you've done the implementation and now you're doing the, the tweaking. Uh, I think now we need to bed down issues of uh, multiple non-work devices, shadow IT that I imagine has absolutely mushroomed for all the obvious reasons in the pandemic. 
So personal phones, personal computers, work computers, you know, there, there is a an unpleasant lack of divide between these devices, in my opinion. I think we need to get our IT admin tightened up. Not me, I'm an, I only work with myself. So um, I, I'm tightening up myself the whole time. Um, but I think we need to try and introduce new employee policies that cater for um, confidentiality, that cater for uh, eventualities of a breach, that cater for uh, using shadow IT, you know, IT that is not provided by your employer. Um, I think that there are positives and, and things like, I think teams, remote, uh, teams that are already geographically remote will become closer because people will be used to communicating by video connection. And so they'll probably have more regular meetings throughout the year rather than one expensive trip to a central location. I think although events have been clearly knocked on the head, in-person events have been knocked on the head, and we have yet to crack the person-to-person -person networking that's so good at these events, I think that event organizers are actually gonna see a much higher attendance because more people can come from more places around the world by video connection. Um, those are my immediate knee-jerk thoughts to that question. Uh, be very welcome to hear what Stacey and Nick have to say if Nick has um, cogitated enough. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I, yeah, I, I, I think, think you highlight... Uh, uh, so, am I hearing an echo through someone's speaker? Is that, I, th I think it might be yours, Jonathan, but I'm not sure. From mine? Yeah, yeah. I think I've got a bit of an echo. Yeah. You can hear my own voice. I don't know where that's coming from. <laughs> uh, definitely not me. Okay. I can't hear it now, so good. It's resolved. Um, yeah, I think what you say about security is uh, quite quite a prevalent point. Um, it's, a, it's a fine line to walk. And, uh, you know, a good example is when people started flocking to Zoom and then we started to hear of the security issues around Zoom. Yeah. Um, but on the flip side of that, I mean, you, you just need to look at the likes of a DLA Piper a few years ago that, had so much red tape to cut through around security that they didn't move away from XP. And then the whole company was held to ransom with an attack. Um, I think we're realizing now that there is some middle ground between the two. Um, as someone who's quite passionate about security, I've always said the weakest point is always the user. Uh, mm -hmm. Social engineering is probably one of our biggest threats. And the fact that we're now out of that controlled kind of secure environment of the office where we can trust everyone around us. And for now, we're just locked into our own homes. But, you know, as people want to start roaming about and being able to do this from anywhere, I think uh, that's where policies become incredibly important. Sorry, Nick, what do you mean by social engineering? Um, but basically, we have, uh, you know, hackers that will kind of, for example, call up someone and uh, pretend to be oh, okay. right. uh, someone else, or they'll send uh, fake emails yeah. or text messages, this kind of thing, yeah. to manipulate the user into performing certain actions. Gotcha. Yeah, thank you. So, yeah, yeah, I mean, I would absolutely agree with all that. And I have to say, Jonathan, that term shadow IT, I hadn't even heard of it until oh. about a year ago or something right. like that. It's just not, sorry, I should um, I d disclose. I mean, I, I am a lawyer and that is my, you know, that was my, that was my, my first day job as it were. And so um, I can genuinely tell you that if there's a will, the lawyer will find the way. I mean, they have Absolutely. to, they, they have Absolutely. to get it done. They have to find you an answer. We want our clients, you know, the best that they are in our best interest and they'll find a way. You know, if, if, if our policy is to not to stick a USB stick in your computer, unless it's password protected, but the computer allows it, you're going to do it. And yeah. um, we squirrel, you know, if, 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 if allowed to, you'll squirrel away data anywhere you want to, you know, yeah. in the cloud on this server and that, you know, back folder over there. And of course you'll do it. If it's faster to move that data around, that's what you're going to do. Yeah. So shadow IT, absolutely something that we, you know, definitely need to um, get on top of more. And, do you know, it's not... I absolutely don't fault the user at all because, you know, I, I was that person. Um, yeah. I, I just want to get it done and, and I want to get it done well. Uh, so I don't fault the user at all. I think we need to do more training, more education um, so that our users know what tools they have available to do the job that they want to do. So, you know, you'll come across people who never even, but no, no fault to them, themselves at all, but, you know, they don't know how to merge a PDF together or they don't know how to, 
um, well, maybe e-signing is a bit more more modern, so I don't want to fault anyone for that. But um, you know how to uh, you know hyperlink something, or again, maybe that's well, the next we all, step. We all know that the lawyers only know a maximum of twenty percent of the hundred percent utility in, in Word, for instance. Mm -hmm. Excel is a complete rainstorm to them. Rain, not brain. Rainstorm to them. Um, they just, you know, they're comfortable doing what they need to do within the constraints of, of the familiarity of, of getting it done quickly because it's a familiar way of doing it. it it's yeah. almost um, uh, what muscle memory. You know, th this is how I do it, and I do it that way because I do it quickly. We might come onto that in just a minute uh, onto that issue. Uh, but what I'm hearing, which is interesting, is at the moment you're talking about not technological solutions but management solutions. That's what employee, hmm. you know. It's um, about the people. It's absolutely about the people, it, for sure. That's, that's what you've got to refine. It's not so much the technology you've got to refine. It's the it's the people that you've got to refine. Training. It's what, it was ever thus. That sort of thing. Was and ever thus. there has to be, you know, that element of um, sympathy and empathy when doing so. Because, you know, you don't just, you know, sledgehammer them with, you know, all the best tools in the, in the wonderful world. Obviously, they're not going to use it. Um, but, you know, they get there. And if you do it incrementally, if you do it, you know, bit by bit and um slowly, you know slowly just, catch a monkey yeah and just the other day somebody had an issue just 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 you know somebody had an issue out with outlook so i said oh did you know that you can get your outlook by going on to office.com i know oh, by the way whilst you're there why don't you look at all the other apps we've got available and so slowly they're starting to realize how they can access other things access other um software programs data in a different way um and you know bit by bit i mean we're not a large law firm i should also say, you know, we're sort of a, I guess what I would call medium to small sized law firm, uh, just under 100 people, you know, so there's only so much resource available, or there's only so much. Um, and we do rely a lot on our users to be proactive. Um, I think we're really good at that, actually, but that's just my perspective. But. I'm just at this point, I'm going to start a poll. Um, we've got a poll here about this will t teach us something about whether people are going to go back to the office. Um, so everybody in the audience, if you want to answer this poll, it's about um, are you going to go back to the office after the uh, pandemic ends? I'll leave that running for a little bit. Um, something you touched on that somebody's mentioned in the chat um, is also in the shadow IT data, uh, data and managing your data. Is that a is that something you've still got to refine in this working from home uh, and future hybrid thing? I mean, I, I imagine it is. But what are your experiences of that? Well, I'm just to chip in uh, uh, on this because uh, this is something that is it is challenging the discovery community, litigators, disclosure, and all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. Is this this? I won't call it a tsunami, but the, all this working from home has created a whole heap of other sources of evidence that need to be considered and that need to be collected if they might contain relevant information to your dispute or your investigation or whatever. Might might need to be uh, collected forensically. So we're back in the wild west in terms of the tech for collection in a forensic manner to be used in a in a in a court during a trial uh there's there's teams has just announced that you can do auto transcripts and and there are so many places and all these collaborative tools slack and snapchat and that people are using in addition to the the, the uh, permitted methods of um uh, corresponding with their colleagues uh, there are so many other different places that need to be considered that it, it's Leaving aside the cyber, leaving aside the hacking, leaving aside the, and I'm sure we'll come on to data analysis, which this would segue neatly into. Um, there is just so much stuff of the same flowing around all over the place, multi multiplied by the number of devices, the number of avenues or channels, the number of people who access those same channels and have the same data. It's, it's, it's incredible. Mm. I'd say data management probably mm. sits right up there on my what I'm doing on a daily basis, issues that we have to deal with as a firm. App data management is a huge. Um, and in construction, we have lots of it. We have drone footage, we have programs, we have contact files, construction, um, you know, all right, you've got your own school, um, site diaries used to scan it and all this other um, you know, There's so much data in construction that we see a huge amount. And I'm hearing this. Apologies. Um, if you if you can't do something in a particular location, nine times out of ten, the user is going to copy it somewhere to where they can't do it. So if they can't hyperlink a document in this platform, they're going to copy all that to somewhere else where they can sort it out. 
So those are sort those are the sort of data management issues that you have to be live to, depending on where you keep that sort of big data. Um, and I would 100% agree with the, the disclosure issues that we face that Jonathan just mentioned as well. Lawyers are like water, really. I mean, this was Bruce Lee's analogy. They won't try and go through a rock, they'll go round it, just like Stacey said. Um, so you can't, if, if, if there's a, a, a millimetre of give to allow them to do something like what they want to do, they'll do it every time. The amount of times I've taken out my own credit card and bought something very expensive because I needed it to serve as a client and then worried about getting the money back from the, that client or whatever later because you just don't have the time and it's usually late at night. I, I'm going to give myself a shameless plug here, if that's right. <laughs> um, so one of the reasons we started Legal Legends was uh, purely because as we are selling Ruby data into various firms, uh, the word data silos was used quite frequently. And when we started to explore like the different options, we had various people like kind of asking us for a bit of help there. Um, and what we came to realize is that there are platforms out there trying to solve everything that but um it's it's really hard to be the best at every aspect of legal technology and build everything into one platform um and there's other kind of firms out there that uh, are too small to offer integrations uh many law firms won't have their own development team or integration team uh, so we kind of set up the company to be that bridge between the two. Take a look at what tech uh, law firms have, um, what they don't have, and try to build some like bespoke links in, like integrate the technology together, centralize where the data sits so we don't have, you know, the same documents sitting on five different platforms. You don't have to download a like two terabyte PST file onto your desktop just to upload it to another platform. Uh, just to extract it in this one and then analyze it in this one. I mean, these things take so much time and it would be great if the file sat in one location that could just flow between the platforms. Uh, so this is this is exactly why we started the company because it's a bit of a mess out there. Well, it is, that's, that's because um, firms that aren't lucky enough to have the likes of Dr. Stacy there, um, buy their tech organically. They don't do it at the same time. They don't have any kind of uh, upgrade plans. A partner sees something that looks like it would be really sexy and impress clients and make them look good with an, in their partnership, which is not a partnership, it's a loose cooperative of individuals. So they go and buy it and then they throw it at IT and say, right, make that work for me. And they may not use it. If they do use it, great. And then someone in another department, maybe in, even in the office next door, does exactly the same thing with another piece of tech or a client who makes that tech has said, you really aren't, aren't you not, you're not using our stuff. You should buy our stuff. So to help the, impress the client, they'll buy the client's stuff, which is usually a very wrong decision. So it all develops organically and nobody worries about the things working together. And Stacey said it's all about the user. The amount of times I've seen software bought by, say time recording software, bought by the accounts department because it generates the right reports they need for management. They couldn't give two hoots about the user experience actually to record that time and how it works with, with the user. It's just good for them on their report. So it's, it's, it's a bugger's muddle. And recently I gave a, a, a presentation as part of an ILTA conference about the history of law firms and how they buy their tech uh, and how that's now changing and stuff like that. But it, it, when you're dealing with that kind of historical problem, it really is a big problem that no one really wants to take control of. No. Okay, so I think okay. it's brilliant that you've got that product. I'll, 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 I'll come on to a sort of, a sort of related question here, but I'll, first of all, I'll just read out the, um, the, the, got the poll results. Um, we can see that 60% said they're going to have a flexible arrangement, more time at home. 24% are going to have a flexible arrangement, but with more time in the office. 5% said they're going to go back to the office, and 9% said they're not going to go back to the office. So it, it, we're looking at a hybrid model, and we've got to work towards man, managing that hybrid model. Um, but going from, moving on from what you were just saying there, um, uh, Jonathan, um, one of the things we've heard, um, and we we're discussing this briefly in a sort of pre pre uh, talk talk, um, is going back to basics and making the most of what you've got. And Stacey sort of touched on this as well about mm -hmm. teaching people how to use the problem. Can you do this? Is this is this a trend, or is this uh, is is this been accelerated by um, remote working? Um, is it is it something that people should concentrate on instead of going getting the new sexy? Uh, oh, piece yeah. of most, um, most definitely, I think this is most prevalent in in in-house legal. 
where their budgets are getting um, reduced and they're expected to do more with less and so on and so forth. And they're crying out for automating certain tasks and um, performing triage on frequent requests coming in from the business. And um, I say to them the whole time, look at what you already have. Look at what your business uses, maybe not in your department, and see if there's something already there that you could use to greater effect. Often, things are rebadged to, 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 to sell to a different part of a market. So I, I gave the analogy yesterday of, of two sets of uh, trainers that I had back in the day when I did things on, on the sports uh, field. I had blue flash and green flash, one for squash and one for badminton. It was exactly the same trainer, just in different colors. But I bought each one because they said, this one's squash, that one's badminton. You didn't need to. <laughs> so the more, you know, tech is just tech. And I don't like legal tech. It's just technology. And the more that people can get away from this is specific to legal, and the more they can look at what they already have in their existing stack and make proper use of it, the better. And especially now in this in these days where budgets are tight, where people are either spending or not doing a thing. And if you're not doing a thing, then you have to look around your house. If you have no food in the house, you've got to look around it to see if there's anything you could possibly get away with eating. It's you know, amazing it, what you can find. It's absolutely amazing yeah. what you can find. Yeah. yeah, you might need, I mean, like say if you take a, the, our size of firm, you might need somebody to help you, mm -hmm. you know, like realize the full potential of it, possibly. Um, but absolutely, and it's just amazing what you can find or and as well get rid of because you've realized yeah. you bought something five years ago that no one even knew, knew about that you're still paying a subscription for. But um, I, I absolutely agree with the, um, sorry, and I just put it in there, Jonathan. <laughs> I, I, can, I can take it. <laughs> <laughs> didn't even, that took my seriously, serious apologies. Um, <laughs> but um, I, absolutely, that the, I totally agree with its technology, and that that is really what is advancing. That's 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 what's making us um, faster, more efficient, more productive. Um, if we go for a if if you want to classify something as a legal technology, if we go for something that you might classify that into it, um, we're very very specific that it's absolutely going to the use cases there. We can already see the benefit. It's a no brainer. Well, I'm I'm very good for going for those no brainers. Mm -hmm. um, something that will sell itself internally. Like I know that um, it will just spread like wild wildfire throughout the firm. We've had one or two things that we've used, and you can just tell. And one of them I wouldn't even call you know a legal technology. Um, it's just a massively brilliant search engine. But um, if you can, if someone hears about it and uses it, and they're like, oh yeah, just go use such and such. I don't even have to like show it to the firm because and if they can pick it up and just use it it sort of spreads by word of mouth and those are the ones that really work well for us um and they're not necessarily legal technologies uh, one might be but um but yeah i absolutely agree i think to, to blow nick's trumpet uh, before he does himself uh, he wrote a very good article very good article uh, very recently on the user experience in software and being empathetic and if the user doesn't want to use it they're not going to use it and the, all the points you've been making stacy nick numerates in a very good article mm. it's an artificial lawyer on artificial lawyers when was it published just so for the audience uh, i think it was two or three days ago it's very recent anyway it should be the latest articles well it's in my bong of course yeah, yeah. <laughs> everyone should absolutely read on a daily basis to keep up to speed <laughs> uh, just uh kind of moving on from what well echoing on from what Stacy said, uh, I think it's really important that users should be able to just pick up technology and use it. Um, I think when AI was a hot topic, maybe a couple of years ago, I mean, it still is to a degree, but it was a big buzzword back then. Um, there was a lot of AI tools kind of coming into the market and showing really weighted, impressive demos to firms. Uh, and the firms would then adopt the technology and then realize they need a little bit of understanding into how machine learning works and things to get things working for their law firm. Um, but what's not being considered is that every single law firm is very different. It's got different processes, people, types of case, like content in documents, clients. You know, it's, 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 it, it did require a degree of learning and expertise to actually get that technology into the firm and off the ground. So a lot of it, a couple of years later, was dropped. Um, a few days ago. Yeah, yeah. 
um, you know, I think a lot of trust was lost in uh, AI technology at the time as well. And I think, um, you know, a, a bit of reluctance to adopt it. Um, I actually saw uh, a demo of a really good product the other day called uh, Della AI. And um, I was so blown away by their approach to it because the user interface was just absolutely incredible. Like as I, as I saw them move through the system, it was um, it just presented to you like, you know, this is what you need to click next. Um, and it enabled the user to teach, uh, teach the uh, system, but without any kind of understanding into the, uh, the technical side of it, really. And I think that's the way we're going also, um, you know, it, with technology. I think the lawyer just needs to be able to pick it up um, and use it. Uh, you know, I've heard legal tech companies or tech companies say, oh, we've got an impressive support team where, you know, we're available on hand if you need to use it. But I've always said, we shouldn't have to have such a big support team. I mean, you know, users should be able to serve themselves with the technology. They shouldn't have to ask where a button is, where a menu is. They should be able to just see where it is and uh, be able to perform the actions they want. I agree, absolutely. I, I don't think AI has, has had its day yet. I think what has had its day is the enormous hype by the salespeople within the AI companies. Um, I think AI is an incredibly, technology generally is incredibly complicated for someone who's not interested in it, uh, nor has that as their, uh, in their job title. So your average lawyer, they just want to know that their lives are gonna be easier and faster and they can build lots of money and get the partners off their backs. Simple. Um, I think that there was so much hype around AI that Tracy mentioned a little bit earlier about that if you've got a use case, it kind of sells itself. The problem with AI is that it doesn't have a use case, not AI. If you make a use case, take a bit of AI and create a, a workflow that solves a problem that a particular type of person faces on a regular basis, and they can just press the green button to make it happen, and it makes it happen, they'll buy it. But if you just say, oh, anything you want to do, just get AI and you can make it do anything, then no one's going to buy that because they can't comprehend that, what anything is. And then all the AI people seem to hook onto contract review and LIBOR and all that kind of stuff, and they suddenly had a use case. And that was thrust hard down that particular route within legal. Uh, and everyone else was kind of forgotten. But Stacey, she's using her AI in a way that makes sense to her firm. It's, it's offering something that they couldn't do easily, if at all, before, which is brilliant. But if you just get AI, it's going to end up on the floor. Because you, if you don't have, as you said, what, I, what are being called data scientists, to help you understand how you can use it to make sense of what you've got or what you're getting, then it's just going to sit there and gather dust. A couple of things on, on, on AI then, Jonathan. Um, what get, looking forward i mean you say well, there's been a bit of a hype cycle obviously you yeah. know we we'll go through the hype cycle thing of ai um in the next year where where, where will it be successful if, if if at all um and what what particular types i mean you mentioned document view is obviously where it's, it seems to be at the moment is, is there anywhere else it could sort of uh, hmm. find its find its way the other thing is does anybody have any concerns about you know, any ethical issues with of um with the use of AI, not knowing exactly what the output might be. I mean, it depends on what circumstance you're using it, but are there any concerns? And, and, and will there be any requirements for training and upskilling the, 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 the people working on these systems to understand that? I, I, I'm just going to say one thing and then I'll shut up because I've been talking a lot and I know that these two have a lot to say as well. But it's not just the output, it's also the input. Yeah. You have to understand the input and, and you know, we all have opinions about what you need to do to get good input, clear water, not dirty water. But anyway, I'll shut up now. Uh, could I say a couple of things? Yeah, certainly, um, certainly, go ahead. <laughs> so uh, I think the, the big trend we'll see around, well, a couple of trends around AI. Uh, firstly, uh, this move away from AI as a way to kind of automate things uh, and towards uh, a way to empower users. So rather than try to do all the kind of a due diligence for them, perhaps uh, have AI as, almost as a power suit in the same way as you start typing things into Google, it suggests things for you. So it enables uh, the, the lawyer to just do their job easier uh, rather than for them and then correct the mistakes. Uh, the, the other area I think will be around security. 
Um, I think there'll be a lot of uh, AI brought in that can kind of monitor user actions, uh, monitor their habits, um, you know, how they're using various pieces of technology and be able to spot patterns that differentiate from the norm and then flag them up to IT admins, um, especially with working uh, when everyone's working from home as well. I think, uh, you know, it's I think you'll get privacy pushed back on that. Yeah, I was going to mention that. I was going to say both privacy and just employee rights. Yeah, uh, it's an intrusion on all that kind of stuff. Yes. Sure, sure. I mean, I yeah, I mean, it's you, the great thing about AI is you don't have to necessarily have it um, feeding back to like, you know, uh, the mothership. It, it can sit on the computer and just advise users. It doesn't have to send that data off anywhere. And can be anonymized. It's, it's, it's the data and the actions that are important, not the individual's identity. Yeah, exactly. Um, I think, you know, there's there's various kind of uh, home camera systems, for example, that uh, analyze your kind of movement around the house. And then if something suspicious happens, it will flag it to you. Um, it doesn't necessarily go to uh, an external center that monitors it all. I, I mean, there's there's a lot to consider there, a lot of hurdles, but I do think that that's going to be a very booming industry. Um, maybe this year, maybe next, but it's certainly coming. I think um, I don't have much to add to that, to be honest, but I would say that I do appreciate when um, companies say, this is not AI, this is machine learning, or this is what it is. It's, you know, it's actually, we built this, but it, you know, it's not actually using AI. And rather than sell you something that it's not, because, um, and, and we, we bought stuff like that. And they're, they're very upfront to say, this is not AI. We actually use lawyers to do X, Y, and Z. We do the computer to do X, Y, and Z. And, we, and this is the way it works. And having that transparency is really helpful for myself because when I, when people get nervous about AI, I can tell them, actually this isn't, but this might be over here. And it's it's a lot easier to to, to understand it in that way. Um, I mean, even a number of years ago when we got, um, there's a couple of products out there that do this, but you know, it's a word add-on that's basically very clever. It links into case law and tells you if you've got your case citation wrong, it's basically glorified word. Um, but our lawyers were like, oh gosh, is it gonna change my document? It can't possibly change my document. I, I don't want it to change anything. But if you explain it to them that they're actually it's just pointing it out to you and then you can accept or reject. Um, so having an understanding of how something works is is very um, helpful uh, for so many reasons and transparency. But obviously, you know, there's that element to it. So I can see I can see these issues of, um, you know, the, the ethical issues and all these things are on, on the rise that are very are so important to, to getting it right and, and embedding it when it when it gets to that point. Yeah, I, I agree that um, it really helps to explain why something needs to be done in a certain way um, so that people, in particular back to the policies in particular, so people can understand the results, the, the outcome of them not doing that or the risk of them not doing that and the displeasure of their partnership if they decide to go against the policy. But there is an interesting um, deployment of AI in my area of litigation, which is a company that is um, working on the technology, the software, to enable this is for litigation funding they look that they're, they're working on software that would look at the matters in a case that is requesting funding and they would perform triage and work out the likelihood of it succeeding uh, based on the matters the parties mm -hmm. the jurisdiction the values the court all that kind of stuff that will be absolutely fascinating that will have many many implications on how law firms approach uh, matters on how funders approach matters on how open the courts are to this and indeed i think ai is going to have a tremendous impact positive impact on access to justice in what way sorry well it's going to it's it's i i would hope and again you asked about what might happen uh, yeah. i would hope that ai would make I read, I read um, a, a, a very um, depressing book, a very well written, but very depressing book quite recently, which uh, involved a couple who had a BNB and b in Wales that um, was foreclosed on for simply because they, they loaned some money to a friend who then turned, or they borrowed some money from a friend who then turned on them. And they found at the last minute a document that would prove their innocence. And before they, could, they filed it at court, 
and they still lost everything they owned. They were turned out on the streets simply because they didn't get it in within the 48 day or 26 day deadline required by the court. So even though they were completely innocent, they lost everything and their children lost everything. Um, so I think the more that the necessary but arcane and somewhat difficult to find procedure around going to law can be improved by AI and made, and made simpler. If, if we can't make the process simpler for the reasons that it's developed like this uh, safety for everybody concerned, then we must be able to interpret it in a way that the average person can understand and can benefit from rather than have to not only win their case, but also understand the entire white book or green book of civil procedure or criminal procedure if they're acting for themselves because they can't afford their own legal representation. Uh, so I think AI has a lot to do there in simplifying not just legal process and procedure, but in simplifying ways in which the person on the Clapham Omnibus um, conducts their um, uh, real estate, their, 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 their conveyancing or, or probate. You know, there are places where technology like Bitcoin and AI and things like that can actually make these laborious, time consuming and very confusing processes so much easier for all of us. And I think that's a big place where AI and all sorts of tech, like your um, thing you're doing with Richard Susskind on the uh, online courts. I mean, these are all tremendous steps forward for the common person. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm talking about AI in that, in that context. In, in India, we had a conference to launch this, uh, uh, this online. Tremendous course. backlog in the courts there. Um, they, they are they are trying to use use all of their um, uh, yeah the cases coming through to them uh, uh, in their courts as as a as a huge database to identify whether the, the uh, log jams are occurring, what kind of cases are the ones that are causing the enormous log jams they have. In, in civil litigation in India, um, and it's early stages, but uh, I think that's that, that, that's where they're trying to hit. Um, well, that's that's an interesting thing there. That that that's where we're we're watching right now in the in America, Ross Intel AI against Westlaw. Yeah. yeah. That, 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 where are we with that? Interesting. Uh, I think we're still in. I don't know, but I think we're still in the kind of opening stages, saber rattling, exchanging. Um, vituperative documents with each other and stuff like that, okay. I think. Okay, well, I can see the times we've got. Let's come to another more general question. Let's have a look forward to the um, to, to, to 2021. Um, before I do that, just a very quick question for Stacey. Uh, somebody asked, what was the name, I was going to ask this at the time, but it passed by, what was the name of the good search engine for lawyers? Um, it's AFI. AFI, mm. and if you use it, it has different applications. Um, we use it for a particular, particular way, um, but it really depends on where your data is. So you you may not need it, you may need it, um, but it's 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 really intelligent, it's really fast. But it depends on where your data is. I would suggest for us, it was a no brainer. Um, we use it a lot for early case assessment. We use it a lot for um, uh, analyzing data, pre disclosure type of activity. Um, yeah. What makes it so good? What 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 particularly makes it so good? It's like searching, like you're shopping online for a, you know, you've got the filters. It's so quick; it returns anything. The key, the key actually also is you can connect uh, uh, data silos. So if you've got some data over here, some data in a drawer, some data in net documents, you know, you can connect up those those data silos and search across them. It's not for everyone. It really depends on where your data is, how you work, what type of um, data you're trying to, not necessarily what type of data you're trying to search, but the, the amount of data. I mean, as I mentioned previously in construction, you know, we'll get, you know, so many weird and wonderful, you know, massive amounts of data. Um, and it can be quite helpful. You know, it's not, you know, it's not going to be an answer to everything, but um, yeah, that's what it is. All right, and AP is not the work itself. So, yeah, how is it spelled? A Y S I E. They'll love me. Yes, they will. <laughs> they will. We've done an integration with them also. Uh, I'll send them the recording. <laughs> yeah, and they're, they're nice people as well. Yes, yeah. they are. They are. Okay, I hope they're listening in. Um, okay, what's the one thing you'd like to see more of in, in the legal tech world in 1920, in 2021? 2021? <laughs> 
Well, there was a pandemic in 1921 as well. It's a cyclical <laughs> thing every century about this time. Yeah. Well, we're not that far advanced, actually, in, in, in legal since then. So what would you like to see more of in 2021? What, 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 what me, quite simply, a, a, a better understanding of what technology can do and the application of it. I'm sick to death of telling lawyers that it can really help. Not, it's not a problem. Your screen is not there to collect post-its. It's there to turn on and actually help you in your day. So I, I would like to see a growing number of people who can help people like me and Stacey. And Nick, who, people who can help those who don't want to or can't get it, to get it, to see the light. Evangelists, people who can save money and make solutions and positive outcomes for lawyers and show them exactly what the heck they can do with what they've got. And as Tracy said, help focus them, if they haven't got it, on what would really help them do what they need to do. So solve practical problems rather than just sell hype. So is that a matter of the suppliers doing that, or is that a matter of um, a everybody in law firms? Everybody. Everybody. Yeah, it's yeah. it's a big maturity time warp step leap thing. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I hope to come on from this. I do remember years ago I was working with a, a, um, a, a legal aid um, management software firm, so small firms just going into, and there were people getting in when. Um, Contracting came in for criminal lawyers. Maybe the audience won't remember this: that you had to start using computers to actually get some legal aid out of the legal aid board. And uh, did go in and do some training. Uh, and there was a computer sitting there, still in its still in its box. They hadn't got it out, but when they expected to come along and train train them on this software. So I, I thought we'd moved on from that. But obviously, you're thinking that there's still people out there who don't who, who don't. It's not. That it's not their fault. They've been brought up to look backwards, to work on precedent and what has happened rather than what can happen. They're not taught at law school to be commercial, to be technically aware. There is not a requirement and it still isn't a requirement. And I think fundamentally, we need to accept the fact that they are mere children in this world of, of tech and business. And we need to treat them that way in, in an encouraging and positive way and help them step up and get into the long trousers and become grown ups in this world. They won't happen overnight. And yeah. they shouldn't be penalised for not getting it. Some of them just won't ever get it. That's fine. That's human. You know, my, my sister-in-law is convinced every time she walks in a room, she turns off all the computers because of stuff she emits from her head. Which maybe she does. But that's, you know, it, it's what happens. So I have to deal with it. And I, so I, 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 I don't know, sorry, to, sorry to butt in, but I, it's quite yeah. encouraging, um, the sort of next generation of young lawyers, though. Uh, you know, if we get, you know, a, 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 new, a, new, a new young lawyer, they might be... So, so why are we using this again? Because elsewhere, we, you know, so, so, you know, it's, it's nice that they'll, you know, they'll help to push, help to push the, the, the game, the initiative, as it were, because um, they want to do their job faster and better. And they've seen something elsewhere that they know, you know, can I just download this? Can I, you know, do it? And I, and I think, I think that's quite encouraging on, on that front. Mm. We've had a question um, from one of the audience, from the audience saying, yes, I think lawyers um, have made a, uh, uh, change their thinking towards the future of law enormously in the last five years. So I think that that, that, uh, that chimes with what you're saying there, Stacey. Nick, go on. Have you got anything? Yeah, there's, yeah, there's one thing I'd love to see is uh, that's less focus on the technology to kind of improve efficiency and more, well, for the lawyers and more technology to kind of interfacing with their clients and users. Um, for example, allowing their clients to self-serve a bit more and increasing the transparency, you know, providing a dashboard where they can see their invoices, their matters, uh, outstanding documents, what they need to review, just a lot more engagement, transparency, and um, yeah, the ability to kind of, for example, if you want a contract such as an NDA creating, it could ask the, the client some questions, generate one, and then have the lawyer look over it rather than go straight to the lawyer. Uh, more technology in that kind of atmosphere would be great. We've and had I, that, that technology since the 90s, things like hot dogs that will do exactly that. Yeah. I remember hot dogs, actually. Yeah. <laughs> 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 um, I, I would say on that front, front Nick, I, I, I think it's brilliant, actually, because a lot of initiatives are coming from clients. Clients mm -hmm. want, they want val value added. You know, how many times have, have I filled out a tender? How, how, how are you going to add value to the service that you provide to us? Um, and, you know, I, I think, you know, it's brilliant because clients are starting to demand it, demand how are you using 
And they won't necessarily, no, they will. They will say, how are you using technology to, to, to deliver us a better service, uh, better value, i.e. a cheaper bill. Um, but but it is not always the case because, um, you know, they do, they are quite interested in, so what do you do internally that helps how you advise us? So this dispute you must have dealt with ages. How is it? How does it result? Or what do you, what do you find? What are the analytics around this? Um, and they're the you know you get some very um, brilliant, savvy clients, and it's lovely to see them pushing. Um, to they want this, and that of course is going to to push us to make sure that we have um, you know the best whatever it might be to deliver that. Obviously, we're very cautious in in certain areas, but. Um, but I think it's it's the, the client initiative and the client driven um, um, or requests is is, is 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 fantastic, really. And is that and you can uh, are you seeing more and more of that? Uh, it is, and, and you, you expect to see more of that in twenty twenty one as well. I think so. I think so. And even um, there's an, there's another, I suppose. And say you get a, a larger client who has a panel of law firms. You know they're gonna they're gonna want you to collaborate with each other. They're gonna want to see that same you know client portal experience, so that they're not logging into five different you know platforms. They want you know them to be your, their panel law firms to collaborate to work together um, in this you know in the same sort of fashion. There's there's a lot there's there's that I can see that being we already do we already have seen it, but I can see that growing in 2021 for sure. Is that something you're working on? Is it collaborate? Yeah. <laughs> Cross client collaboration, let's call it, or a cross firm collaboration to, for their clients. Yes, I mean, yes, yes, yes. It does absolutely um, because that's going to that's going to help the client. If they yeah. if they work with five, six, seven, eight law firms, they don't want to do it different ways. And, and similarly, you're seeing a rise of clients having they want your bill presented to, the, to them in a particular way, i.e. the data is hoovered up into their system from all of their different suppliers and lawyers and whoever it might be. So you're you're needing to get on board with their technology. So you've got to be able to interface with their billing system. It's not our billing system. We have to integrate with their billing system. And you need to be alive to that and make sure your systems are flexible enough and and that you're open you know, to it. Obviously there's limitations and you, know, you can only go so far in certain areas. But um, absolutely a lot of that. Yeah. And I, I think that's to the law firm's advantage as well, because the, the more that you can get your hooks into your client, the less likely they are to break away and go somewhere else entirely different. They would be more prepared to sit down and discuss issues with you than just flounce off and instruct another firm, because it is technically much more difficult for them to do when you're so connected. Mm. Absolutely. Okay. Final, final question then to discuss um, uh, as we're running out of time. Is there anything genuinely new and exciting out there um, that's going to come in, start to come in, in 2021? I mean, obviously, these things do run, so they take a while to, to get round uh, to everybody, but is there anything genuinely new and exciting in legal tech out there? Let's, I'll give you one example to start off with, perhaps VR, NVIDIA, in co video conference meetings to make it a bit more immersive and, and virtual build. Um, I've, I've read about the, you know, this is where people think they're going. And is there anything else out there? Mike, Can I, may I? Yes, certainly, John. Go ahead. Thank you. And that's exactly my thinking. I've, I've long seen a problem with AI or machine, whatever it is, long seen a problem with the automation of some of the more basic tasks in legal means that the traditional way of learning your profession as a kind of apprentice when you join a law firm as a trainee or an article clerk, and as you progress up the ladder and gain more experience, traditionally that experience has been garnered by following people who already know what they're doing and are very experienced and doing repetitive, boring legal tasks that immerse you in your area of law. Um, if those go, rightly so, I, I, I think, then I see a vast gap for that training and learning process. It won't be there anymore. So I see things like VR as being a really good replacement. So you can not just have a classroom experience, you can have that kind of apprenticeship virtually you're still having the experience. You're just not actually getting your fingers covered in dust because you're wading through 30 year old documents. Um, so I think that is a way in which we could plug certain gaps. And in addition, we talked about uh, attending events and, and not in, and not being in person and therefore missing out on the networking thing. I went to a late last year, a most fantastic online event where everybody had their own avatars, which they could customize. It had a room, areas where you could wander around from one room to another. You could hop on a speedboat because you're on an island and go speeding around the island for a bit. You could kick a football around as an avatar. And it was the best way that I've actually walked up 
online to people and chatted and met old friends that I couldn't network with at the moment. So I think there is room here for supplementing the ways that humans like to do things but can't do any more or are unable to do using technology like VR. Yes. Okay, Nick, anything? <laughs> what, what's hot and exciting for me may not be for the majority. I mean, like <laughs> things, things like uh, VR, yeah, they, they sound pretty flashy, I think. Um, I've got a bit of a different opinion from Jonathan. I mean, I, I don't think I'd ever go to a event where i'm a 3d character and walking up to people i mean it's just not my not my scene at all and i i think we may be a long, a long way off but that being the norm um i i been meaning to do something like that to go to one of these just to see how it works but I'll, I'll have it, was, it was it was it was it was really good it wasn't the same what, what, it was, what? what was the event somebody's asking it was no it was uh, i think it was on e-discovery day a thing in the states um, it was organized by ACEDS, and I think uh, an organization, it was the Associated, Association of Certified E-Discovery Specialists in America, which is, has chapters in the UK and, and right. around the world. Um, and they had this their virtual conference. They had stages at which avatars were standing and talking and PowerPoints were being managed within the application. Uh, you were online, so you could just have a tab open in your browser and dip in and out according to what was going on. You could prearrange or arrange there and then with a friend that you haven't actually seen for a year, but you're talking to as if you're standing physically in front of them when it's just your avatar. And you can you know, create your avatar to look like you are with, with a, a full head of dark brown hair and flowing locks and uh, no, sun, no glasses and, and clean shaven and that kind of stuff. Uh, so there is an element of stalking in there, yes, but it's an environment that's kind of safe because it's under the banner of a professional organization and the people in there are professionals, many of whom, all of whom know a fair number of people already in there so and, it, and it, it was the best i've done a number of these virtual conferences as an attendee and this was by far the best experience of all of them okay sorry i interrupted you there nick did you want to finish off what you're going to say <laughs> yeah I, I think i interrupted him sorry <laughs> <laughs> i i just have a kind of gut feeling that these things are are fun for a, a very fleeting moment but they will die off um you know quite quickly and i feel like very soon i mean i don't know how long this pandemic is going to go on for i mean it could be a month it could be years um but either way i think uh i for one i'm certainly missing that in-person human interaction um and i i feel many others will be as well i mean oh, like, yeah, yeah. in the room with people and uh, as soon as that happens um and we're able to go to events again i think this uh kind of VR technology will quickly uh, die off, at least for a, a couple of years or so until we're able to kind of, you know, find purposes for it elsewhere. Yeah, that's interesting. I mean, we've had a, you know, a huge success uh, at, at a webinar series that we started um, last May or April, May, whatever it was, and, you know, huge success. But we find, you know, there's you know, we've obviously been analyzing, you know, how many, you know, how long, what's the best sort of time for a webinar? You know, I mean, how long should it be? Is there webinar burnout? But, you know, we're consistently getting a lot more people than we ever would have attended in the, in the sort of physical, you know, conference room or seminar room than we would have ever got. So obviously that's something that's very important to us. But at the same time, there are sort of topics that lend themselves to being longer than that 45 minutes or hour. And actually you need a bit more engagement to make that particular topic work. So we're trying to find ways where we customize the topic that we know that our clients or audience wants to hear about, but at the same time, we still have things where like, actually that would really lend itself to being a really good um, you know, sort of, you know, workshop or whatever it might be, not an hour, but actually that's really a two hour thing that people, you know, would be really pleased about. Could that work in the sort of VR, sort of avatar type but probably yes um uh, would will we get there in the 2021 Fennekelly in the avatar world i don't quite know um i'd love to but um i know we would be we would welcome some some events that were were in person so that we could deliver some of the content um that we know that people are sort of um yearning for okay at that point um we're over our hour um so people are gonna have to go and start having dinner and things like that um the message I take from this was actually it's not the technology that we've got to look at in 2021. It's the people and or your avatar. 
Um, so uh, I think I think people first is, is is the message perhaps for 2021 to get people on on board with the technology and feeling confident and feeling secure in both senses of the word. I think so. Thank you all to the panel uh, for today's uh, event. Thank you all to the audience. Um, I've got some questions coming through. So sorry if we can't get through to all of them. Um, there is a recording going to be made available, and, and I think that will be circulated to everybody who signed in. But uh, I'll leave that to Law Tech London. Uh, but thanks for your time. And uh, yes, uh, let's all hope we have a safe 2021. Thank you all. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much. Take Thank care. You very much. Thank you.